I'm praying that God will, in a very special way, um, move on my heart and on yours. I'm the one that chose that song when the roll is called up yonder, and I started weeping as it was being sung because I have a couple of daughters that don't know God anymore. And uh, I suppose there's a number of you that struggle with the same kind of thing. So my prayer this morning is for all of us to come closer to our Savior. I believe that he wants to give you, he wants to give me the kind of love that will overwhelm people that don't know him. Now this morning, we have a uh, challenging topic. Before we dive right into it, we'll take just a moment as we have every night here this week to take up the questions that have been turned in the night before. Uh, and the question that was raised first was, why do you equate animal sacrifices with feasts or the feasts? I don't think that was the way we characterized it, but when Jesus sacrificed his life, it uh, ended the need for animal sacrifices. Uh, the long history of animal sacrifices from the Garden of Eden. And by the way, if you were here last evening, what did it say in the book of Hebrews about the blood of those animals? Did that uh, provide forgiveness for our sins? No. And so it was a symbol of Christ's blood that God felt needed to be done looking forward to the death of our Savior. And the feasts that the Israelites Israelites were taught to uh, use were part of this whole system of keeping in mind that one day the Savior would give his life for us. And so uh, we feel that this, the, these, the uh, feasts, and there's a number of them, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Weeks, the Passover, the various things that the Jewish people were taught. A person can, can follow those if they want, but it's quite clear in the New Testament that these aren't mandatory anymore since Christ died. Why do Christians celebrate Christmas and Easter? Because they have pagan origins. It's a good question. Jesus was not born on December 25, was he? He was probably born in the spring because the shepherds were out there with their sheep. I've never seen, um, and I, I, I have a number of parishioners through the years that were shepherds. And when it snows, those sheep aren't out there anymore. They've got some kind of protection. So I'll just say this. I don't, we don't, I don't, we don't celebrate Christmas in that sense. But at Christmas time, have you ever noticed how open people are to hearing about something about Jesus? And so I think it's a time when we can take advantage of people's openness. I don't consider it celebrating Christmas, but I certainly... Um, I think it's a wonderful time to talk about Jesus because people are there. And the same thing is kind of true with Easter. We don't celebrate that. I suppose some Christian churches do. I can't speak for them. But uh, it's not something that uh, we promote as a denomination or a church. Are there any other churches that obey God's commandments? I think this question was probably asked in the, in the sense of Sabbath keeping. And yes, there are many. Uh, in fact, the Seventh-day Adventist people, when they formed a church back in uh, the early 60s and even before the church was formed, they were all Sunday keepers. Most of them came from Sunday keeping churches. And a young woman named Rachel Oakes, who was a member of the Seventh-day Baptist church, said, you, you folks claim that you're following the Bible. And he said, well, yeah. And she said, the Bible teaches that the seventh day of the week is the Sabbath, not the first day. And that's how the group that eventually became the Seventh-day Adventist people, if you will, learned about the Sabbath. Seventh-day Baptists are still active. Uh, the Church of God's Seventh Day, the Armstrong Church was a separate one from that. There's a number of groups that uh, follow the Bible in terms of uh, keeping a day holy, and we're going to look at that 
a little bit here, of course, this morning. The seventh angel blows his trumpet. Which angel is this? I'm not sure how that question means because it is the seventh angel. My wife and I have been studying the seven trumpets. We have gotten a syllabus from a friend of mine that's almost 600 pages long. And every day for worship, we listen to Stephen Bohr. And you ought to write that name down. You can print the syllabus out free of charge. If you want to pay for his lectures on a CD, it's not a DVD, it's a CD. That'll cost you $50. But you can get on YouTube these days. And if you will write down Anchor Bible School, Seven Trumpets, you know how it is, folks. Any combination of those words in any order you want, Google will figure it out, right? And then there are something like 60 hours of lecture. And my wife and I uh, are largely through that. But it's a fabulous thing, friends. I, I think every single Christian should avail themselves of this series of lectures, and, and you should have the syllabus with you. Uh, I printed it out and made two big <laughs> notebooks of it because it was too much for one, it seemed like. And uh, what you'll learn in that is that the seven trumpets are similar to the seven churches. The seven trumpets cover eras of Christianity, epochs, if you will, as do the seven churches. And the seventh trumpet is, if you'll look in chapter 10, the last two verses, which really should be part of chapter 11, it says... But in the days of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. This trumpet is uh, being blown, if you will, just before the very end of time. And uh, that's what that trumpet is about. Uh, I think you would find it very fascinating to uh, uh, become a deeper student of those questions. All right, I have a question for you this morning. Would you be willing... I'm going to do it anyway, right? <laughs> Would you be willing to let me make a case, a biblical case, for God's plan for us to keep the seventh day of the week holy? There was a time when Sunday was kept holy by most Christian churches. I don't know if you know this. That's all gone. Did you know that? The Sunday churches, the Sunday worshiping churches, no longer teach that the day is holy. God never made that day holy in the sense that he did the seventh day. So allow me, if you would, to make a case from God's word on that topic. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form. It was void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. i got to be careful not to get sidetracked. I have no problem with scientists finding out that rocks are millions of years old. I think the Bible is teaching that, that, that the earth with mostly water uh, had been there for a long time. Are you all with me on that? That's okay with me. Uh, and God came along and, an angel, and it says that uh, the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then it describes creation. God said, let there be light. There was light. And by the way, who is the principal actor in this creation of the world? It's Jesus Christ. You know that it says in John chapter 1, there was nothing in the universe that was made that he did not make. This is amazing. Now the Father and the Spirit are together in this operation, but Jesus Christ is the principal uh, actor in creating. God saw. So when it says God saw, it's talking about Jesus he saw the light, it was good, and he divided the, night, the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and he called the darkness night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Pretty familiar to most of you, maybe every one of us. And God made the firmament, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament. That's a word we don't use much. The firmament is just speaking of the air. Uh, in the firmament of the heaven, 
to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. God created great whales and every living creature that moves with the waters brought forth abundant, which the waters brought forth abundantly. And every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good, and he made the beast of the earth after every kind, and so forth. I didn't include all the words of how each day was ended and so forth, but I'm just giving you the background. Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to his kind, cattle, creeping things, beasts, and so forth. All of this was done uh, in these six days. And finally, God said, notice, let us. Are they working together? Yes, they are. Let us make man in our image. Folks, this is one of the most amazing and mysterious things to humankind. We will never completely comprehend this until we're together in the kingdom. And we can ask the Father, can you give us, the be can you give us a more full description? Does it mean that you and I look like God? Well, in some sense, no doubt. I think there are more important aspects of God that he had in mind. He made us, he designed us to be loving creatures. He designed us to be people who help each other. He designed us to love. And oh, does this world need love today. You think what would happen, folks, to the world if people loved each other. There would never be a no vote. Every act in Congress would be something that was a blessing to everybody, and it would all be yay, right? There would be no discord. Can you imagine that? In any home, in any legislative body, no discord. The news uh, uh, producers would go out of business. There's nothing bad to tell about, and so forth. Made in his image, folks. And by the way, that is a call for me and for you to, to strive to let him make me more and more like himself. Amen? The Bible is clear on that plan. And there's songs about it. I would be like Jesus. You remember that song? I love that song. Made in his image. My, what an amazing um, a thing that God gave mankind, man and women. God saw that everything he made, and behold, it was very good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. Could God have done that all in one instant? Yeah, he had a reason, folks, for doing it at a step at a time. And finally, his crowning of creation was mankind. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. But, remember, the... This is in the Old Testament, but the same idea is there. On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. I'll put a few more minutes. Um, and notice what he did about that. He blessed the seventh day. He sanctified it because that in that seventh day he had, re he had rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So the question is, what does it mean to be sanctified? There is a dictionary definition. Uh, there are aspects of this uh, that are even perhaps uh, deeper, but uh, he set it apart for a holy use. This is what the Bible teaches, friends, that God set apart the seventh day of the week. He established the weekly cycle in the creation process, and he set apart this last day for a special holy use. The devil hates that. Anything that God does that might help people to be holy, he hates it. And he has been striving, folks, to destroy what God had in mind for people from the very beginning. And Satan uh, was uh, not quite yet active. It's quite clear that he was already dreaming of fighting against God. But it was after the earth was created, we don't know just how long, but not very long, that Satan became very active and hated this. Now, 
you, we could settle this whole question. I said to you, let me make a case for Sabbath keeping. We could settle the whole question by just reading the fourth commandment, if you will, which I'll put on the screen. Here's what God said. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. The Hebrew word is Shabbat. We say Sabbath of the Lord, those capital letters, whenever that's in the Bible, that means what was translated as Lord is Yahweh. Yahweh is actually Jesus Christ. If you look through the Old Testament, every time this word is used, it's really speaking of Jesus Christ. The Father is sometimes deeply connected with that same word. But the Father, this is interesting, folks. Instead of him being the glorious creator, he, he, he had Jesus take that role. So really, Yahweh refers to Jesus Christ. In any case, uh, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it, you shall, not, you shall do no work. I started quoting it as it was going to be in the King James. And this is uh, the New King James. You, nor your son, nor daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle even, even a visitor who is there inside your property, should not be working. For in six days the Lord worked. He made heaven and earth and the, and the sea and all that is in them. But he did what, friends? He rested the seventh day, and he calls for you and me to do that. Now, right now, I'm making the case for that. I want to take a little time as well to help us grasp why he would have done that. And that would help inform us as to what we do. You know, I've spent a lot of my life helping people come to know what the Bible teaches. And when you first start out, you really don't know how to keep the Sabbath. I understand that. And I want to help you think about that uh, by looking through the scriptures to see how uh, the instruction is there. So the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Very, very interesting. This is carried on throughout the, throughout the Bible. In uh, the book of Isaiah, there is this counsel because sometimes people they don't necessarily want to do what God said. And so he made this interesting statement and had Isaiah write it down. If you will turn away your foot from the Sabbath, he means from stepping on it. And if you were here one night when I was talking about the Eastern mindset, the Eastern mindset is that the foot kind of is a dirty thing. And if you even show the bottom of your foot to somebody by crossing your leg while you sit there and the bottom of your foot is visible, that's an insult. So there's more to this than the average American would understand. If you will stop putting your foot on Sabbath, if you'll turn away from that, if you, will, if you will do my pleasure on my holy day, and if you will call this day a delight, if you will call it holy from the Lord, if you will call it honorable, then you will delight yourself in God, in the Lord, in Jesus. And I will cause you to ride, this is a metaphor, I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth. And I will feed you with the heritage of your father Jacob. So this is being spoken to Israelites. Now, friends, I think most of you know this, but let me remind you, we studied this week that in a metaphorical sense, we are all to be Israelites. That is to say, children of God. So this is speaking to us, not just Jewish people. Uh, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. This is metaphorical about God's blessing. For the mouth of Yahweh, if you will, has said this. So the Sabbath, this is according to Mark. Mark was not one of the disciples. Uh, Mark was a missionary. And he got out on the mission field and got scared and ran home. And some of his friends didn't like that, but he became a wonderful, a wonderful follower of Jesus. And he wrote the very first gospel. There's four gospels that are written. You probably know that, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Mark wrote the first one. 
And he said, he, he understood this. He said in his writing to the church, he said, the Sabbath was made for man to be a special blessing. And I'll speak about this a little more as we go on, folks. You just think about this. Americans and the world are just going full speed helter-skelter to earn money and to live the fast life and to buy and sell and just have fun, correct? And that's pretty empty, actually. If you think about it, it's pretty empty. And God has given us this day of rest, not just to stop working, but to take some time with him. So the Jewish people, they were not the first people that were given the Sabbath. But because when God created the earth and people, things went downhill pretty fast. The first two boys that were born, one of them killed his brother. I mean, that's sad. Things went so bad, you know this, that uh, the mayhem on the earth, you can't, you can't imagine, folks. If, if somebody was stronger than his neighbor, he took his wife. It was just, it was horrible. And finally, God, the Bible says God repented that he had made man. There wasn't anybody on the whole face of the earth that was willing to let God lead their lives and make them lovely people except Noah, his wife, and their children, and their daughters-in-law. And this is hard, folks. God killed everybody on the whole planet except those eight people, and he started over again, and things went downhill again. So he finally chose Abraham. He chose Abraham before he was born to be the father of what was to be a great nation of loving people that would help everybody in the world to learn what it meant to love each other. Are you all with me on this? How did they do? Not too well. The Israelites missed it, unfortunately. And now God has given that work to anybody who will, is willing to be his child. And he still, and so he gave directions to the children of Israel. I'll show you that the, the, that the laws of God existed before they were written on stone. Those laws were from the beginning of creation. But at that point in time with the Israelites, as you know, most of you know the story, uh, he wrote them on stone. Now, there are, it's an amazing story, friends. Satan hates a Sabbath day of rest because when people enter into that experience, it tends to make them become more and more like Jesus. They need that time to lay aside all ordinary issues and spend the time in fellowship, in prayer, in study, in ministry. And that day every week just helps people grow in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? The devil hates it. So he dreamed up a plan try to destroy this precious experience that God wants to have every one of his children be part of. And uh, in the Bible, God uses his people. He refers to his people as his bride. And anybody on the face of the earth can become the bride. Now you say that doesn't make sense. In that, in that, in that issue, uh, it's not one person; it's all people. God, God intended all of His people, if you will, to be His bride. And when His people turn away from that, He calls it adultery. It's not physical adultery; it's it's a metaphor that speaks to the fact that it causes damage to the relationship with God. And so in the Bible, in Bible prophecy, a church or people who are following what God wants and endeavoring to be like him, it says in Jeremiah 6, 2, I have likened the daughter of Zion, that's us, 
and he has likened the daughter of Zion to a delicate and comely woman. So in the Bible, God's people are his bride. And uh, if, they, if they worship him, uh, they're faithful. If they worship idols, they are adulterers. Are you all with me on the metaphor? So the title of the message today was Harlotry in the Church. Did you notice it? It's not talking about some member that's become a, 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 a prostitute or something. It's talking about the fact that when we don't, either on purpose or even by accident, uh, understand how God wants us to be his bride, we become harlots. Are you all with me? If you've ever read the Old Testament, this is all over the place. God call, calling the children of Israel harlots. Now, uh, so what the devil has done, unfortunately, he has raised up the idea of being a follower of God while you actually are an idolater. Y'all with me on the idea? And I want you to understand something. I think if you've been here all week, you have picked this up. I have many, many dear friends who are members of Christian churches that are against the idea, the church teaches against the idea of a holy rest day. You, if you were here during the week, this idea came into the church by the devil's efforts through paganism. Uh, it, act, the most notable person that helped make that happen was Constantine. Rome ruled the world. Constantine was the top general. And somehow, he kind of got interested. We have no idea of just the detail of this. And he wanted to be a, a Christian. Uh, who knows exactly why? I, can, I, I won't even accuse him of why. And, and he marched his army through the water and baptized them. And then he said, all my army's Christians. And because he wasn't a converted man, I think most of you know what I mean. We point to our heart. Um, he brought into the church all kinds of pagan ideas. And they were sun worshipers. They worshiped the sun. Uh, you can understand that a little bit. The sun warms things up. Folks, if there's no sun around, things get cold pretty fast. I read a book about the uh, United States base at, on... Uh, Antarctica, even inside the big bubble they make, about five times the size of this building where the other buildings are, it's 70 below inside that bubble. Outside the bubble, it's 130 below or what, however, it's unbelievable. Uh, so you can kind of understand why people were thankful for the sun and without knowledge they might worship the sun. They thought it was a god. And uh, the long story short, folks, is that sun worship was especially emphasized on the day of the week that was for worship of the sun, which we today call Sunday. Sunday. Y'all with me on that? And that got into the Christian church, Sunday worship. And uh, it destroyed what God had in mind for this blessing of the Sabbath. And, the, and as people learned from the word of God and were inspired by him to understand about the true plan that God had for rest on the seventh day, these Sunday uh, worshiping people, and mind you, I suppose that many, most of them meant well. Are you all with me on this? Uh, somebody taught me something a long time ago. Uh, a man older than I was. I was young. He was young, but he was older than I. He taught me something. He said, Jim, learn to put the best construction on people's motives. Do 
with me on that? And uh, I have learned, because in my work, I have rubbed shoulders with many, many people from other denominations. Most of them are deeply sincere. They love God. But you can be deeply sincere, folk, sincere folks and love God and be deceived. Is that correct? Yeah, that can happen to any of us. Any of us. And so they have resisted and come to dislike Sabbath keeping because of the history that got into the church. It came into the Roman Catholic Church to begin with. And when the reformers began to attack the Roman Catholic Church, uh, Protestant churches were formed that, that didn't follow much of the pagan teaching. I listed for you one evening about 12 things that got into the Roman Catholic Church from paganism. You remember that? Teachings and practices that got there from paganism. And when the reformers, their main issue was saved by faith, saved by the grace of God through faith. Because the Roman church was teaching that it, you, by works you would be saved. And Martin Luther was crawling up the stairway on his knees, praying at every step, and it dawned on him from the Old Testament that we are saved by faith. And in that point, today we're saved by faith in God's grace. And he became, uh, he, was, he was a dedicated priest, folks, right? Uh, doing God's work. And uh, what happened was the reformers uh, didn't deal with all of the paganism that had come into the church. And the, one of the principal things that had come into church was sun worship. And the day of sun worship was what? Sunday. And the reformers, that teaching got right into the to the Protestant churches. And along came the, the Seventh-day Baptists and other Seventh-day people. We, the Seventh-day Adventists, learned it from them. And uh, they are now calling out the Protestant churches who are sun worshipers, if you will. And uh, they didn't like that. The Protestant churches didn't. And uh, I can understand that. They believed that they were right. Have you ever believed that you were right and you were actually wrong? Has that ever happened to you? Raise your hand. See, I know about that. I have a, I, where is she sitting? Where's my wife sitting? Oh, she's clear in the back row. Every once in a while, brother, every once in a while, she'll straighten me out. Does she do that? Oh, okay, yeah. Don't straighten me out. In front. Don't, yeah, yeah. Oh, he, oh, he can't hear me, she said. Okay, all right. <laughs> So the Protestant churches, and I have many precious friends who are Protestant pastors and people besides, they mean well, friends. They're trying to protect what they've been taught, that Sunday is the day of worship. But that's not biblical. I'm going to read to you from the Protestants themselves that say, yeah, it's not biblical. And I told some of you that were here this week, do you, do you remember my story about being a member of the Ministerial Association? And one day I was talking to one of them. I stopped there to pray with him. He was under such stress. And like I told you then, I never bring these things up myself. But all of those men there, they know me, of course, and what I stand for. And he just, out of the blue, he said, you know, Jim, I told you this, referring to all 60 pastors, he said, we all know that Saturday is the Sabbath. Isn't that something? We were good enough friends, folks, that he was comfortable dialoguing with me like that. Now, you might say, well, why didn't you say to him, well, then why don't you keep it? Well, you know, folks, let the Lord lead you. Um, I try to be as unconfrontational as I can. I try to develop a love relationship with these people. And uh, another time, he just brought it up out of nowhere. In fact, I'm going to show you the scripture. 
he said, you know, Jim, <laughs> I know that when we get to heaven, we'll be keeping the Sabbath. <laughs> what? <laughs> because there's a text in Isaiah 66 that says, from one moon to another, new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, we'll come together and worship the Lord. And you might say to me, well, why didn't you say to him, well, then why don't you do it now? Well, if, if, if the Lord led you to say that, I'm okay with that. But I maintained a friendship with that man, folks, that I have until today. And uh, I'm certain, now, I, don't, I can't read the human heart. I'm certain that he's sincere. Uh, and I think it might be better for God to lead him than for me to tell him what to do. Now, if he should ask me, if somebody asks me, I'm happy then to uh, have a discussion and open God's word. But my, my point in this story is there are many objections that have been raised by the Protestant community against Sabbath keeping. I won't go over all of them. I want to look at several with you and show you that these things uh, are easily understood when one reads the scripture. One of these is found in Colossians 2. This is probably the most common one. This is Paul writing, let no man judge you, therefore, therefore judge you in food or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come. Do you see the word days that I didn't read? What do you see about that word? It's italicized, meaning that that word was added by the translators. Are you with me so far? They did that because of their understanding of the force of the Greek there. Y'all with me in what I'm trying to describe? And so they realized that in order to make the reader understand what was actually there, they put this word correctly, Sabbath days. And if you understood it, it more deeply, I'm just going to share with you, this is referring to what we commonly call the ceremonial Sabbaths. At the beginning and the end of most of the feast, there is a Sabbath, whether or not it's the seventh day of the week. A Sabbath in the sense that they're supposed to not work and treat it as though it were a seventh day Sabbath, but it usually doesn't fall on the seventh day. Are you all with me on this? In fact, you'll read in, um, it'll come to me in a second, uh, there is this expression used in the Bible it was a high Sabbath, which means that the seventh day Sabbath, that, but the, that the ceremonial Sabbath just happened to fall on the seventh day. Are you all with me in what I'm describing? That's used in the Bible, uh, to, to, and we still use it today. We say uh, it's a high Sabbath, although people who aren't following the feast, that's, that's not something that normally, normally is done. Uh, what, so was the Sabbath a shadow that would go away? Not really, if you stop and think about it. Only after sin came into the picture was there a shadow. And what is meant by that is when you sacrifice a lamb, it is a shadow of Christ's sacrifice. That's the force of this idea. Are you with me on that? You're not nodding real good. but And so there can't be a shadow until there's sin. Are you all with me on that? So the Sabbath was instituted long before sin. It was not a shadow of something. Are you all with me on that? And so, but the Protestant churches will use this text to try to tell you, oh, the Sabbath is not important. And it's an improper understanding of what the scripture is teaching. Let's go on. Some people say, well, the Sabbath was made for the Jews. And the Bible refutes that idea. Luke was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. But he wrote one of the Gospels, we say he was a physician. The training of a physician at that, that time would be a fraction of the training that a nurse gets today. So you have to keep that in mind, of course. But nevertheless, he was a Gentile. And he often referred to uh, Jewish things. He talked about the land of the Jews. He talked about the synagogue of the Jews. He never called it the Sabbath of the Jews. Never. Nowhere in the Bible is it called the Sabbath of the Jews. This was given to God, uh, given by God to people from the very beginning. Uh, you might say, why did he make the Sabbath? Well, uh, it's a memorial of creation. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, 
and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, made it holy. It's a memorial of the work he did in creation. And the distinguishing characteristic of God is that he's the creator of all of this. Christ himself was the active person. You know, you could think of a holiday uh, or your birthday. Uh, you might call uh, a different day uh, your birthday, but unless you were born on that day, that's not your birthday. Is that right? It's like Mrs. Brackett. Her birthday is January 12, 19. Well, she was born on January 12. She can't call her birthday January 15, can she? No. Oh. So uh, Jesus made the seventh day a symbol of his creative work, like the birthday of the world, if you will. Did the law exist before it was written on stone at Mount Sinai? Let me show you that, that that's true. This is... Uh, a writing of Paul, because the law works wrath, for where no law is, there's no transgression. This is mentioned several times in the Bible. There is no such thing as sin if there's no law that says it's sin. So the law existed before Sinai, correct? And I'll show you some more evidence of that. I'm, I'm going through, folks, the objections that Protestants tend to erase about Sabbath, about the validity of the Sabbath and Sabbath keeping. Whosoever commits sin transgresses the law, for sin is the transgression of the law, and if there's no law, there would be no sin in that sense. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Just, just illustrating the function of the law. Another example that Sabbath is ex existed before uh, Mount Sinai is an interesting one. They're journeying through the desert. I'm reading now in the third line. The congregation came into the wilderness of sin. It just was named that. And on the 15th day of the second month, after they're departing out of the land of Egypt, so they've been traveling about uh, a month and a half, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to give them food. I'm going to rain bread from heaven. What's that bread called? In the, in the Bible, the word manna comes from a Hebrew word that means, what is it? And the word is manna. So we're going to have, what is it, for breakfast and lunch and dinner and so forth. And uh, so he rains this bread from heaven, and he says, I want you to gather a certain amount every day. I'm going to prove them to see if they will walk in my law or not. This is very interesting. God provides them food. There's no food in the wilderness. It's dry. It's like around here. Without water, there would be no food, would there? Or very little. So, but he's going to test them. And whenever God tests folks, it's not just to see if he can trip you up. Every test that God brings is designed to help us have a deeper faith in him. How many of you have ever been teachers in a grade school or a high school or a college or a university? Well, a half a dozen hands at least. I give, a, I give an exam to the students. I taught science for years. Um, you know something? I don't need to give them an exam to see how much they know. Those kids are in my class every day. I ask questions to every student throughout the day. I, I, have a, I help them with their homework when they can't do it. Do you think I have a fairly good knowledge of how every student in that class is doing? Say yes. Do I need to give them a test to find out how good they're doing? No. Why do I give them a test? Why do I tell them every day, don't forget there's a quiz tomorrow at the beginning of class? There's several reasons for it. This is an aside as far as teaching is concerned. The science shows that the sooner you give a, a student a test after you taught them something, the easier and better they learn it and the longer they keep it. So every class, there's a quiz right at the start about what we learned yesterday. I'm not doing that, folks, to find out how much they know. I'm doing that to what? Help them. Every test that God lets come into your life Every single trial, folks, every difficulty, God allowed it, is that correct, as a blessing. Well, there are times when I don't think it's a blessing. Do you know what I'm talking about? But my work is to say, okay, Lord, I don't really understand it, but help me. Amen? Help me to understand what you, the change you want to make in. So God is doing that with this food business. 
that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. And here's what he did. This, rain, this food. Every morning he went out and it was like, like snow on the ground. Uh, and they would gather it together, and they were supposed to gather a certain amount. But, but when you come to the sixth day of the week, uh, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be how much more than every other day. They're supposed to gather twice as much. And uh, they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, how much they needed for their family. And the sun gets hot, and it all disappears. Uh, notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses. Some of them left it until morning. That is today, what they picked today, they left until tomorrow. They weren't supposed to do that. And what happened to it when they went to get it tomorrow? It was wormy, and it didn't smell very good. And Moses was angry with them because they didn't do what he told them to or what God had told them. This is that which the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath. Now, we're going on in the story. And by the way, what chapter of Exodus is this in? What chapter of Exodus has the Ten Commandments? This is occurring before there was a Sabbath law written on stone. Are you all with me, friends? That's pretty significant. It's showing that the law of God was there even before it was written on the stone. You get the point. I'm, de I'm dealing with the objections that, that Protestants raise, and Catholics for that matter as well, uh, that uh, the seventh day is not really God's plan. So bake what you will today. That's the fourth line. And that which remains, lay up for you to be kept till the next day. That's fourth line from the bottom. And they laid it up till morning, as Moses had said. And it did not what, friends? And there were no... So this is a bunch of miracles. Is the, is the raining down of manna a miracle? Is the fact that it uh, melts when the sun comes up a miracle? Because it didn't melt in their cupboard, correct? And the fact that it melt, it, the next day if they kept it and it got rotten, was that a miracle? Isn't that something? It's a miracle that God made it rotten. You ever thought about that? And the fact that on Friday when you gathered twice as much, on Sabbath morning, what you gathered yesterday was another miracle. Is that correct? A whole bunch of miracles God is using to try to teach these people to trust him and to follow his direction, or you could call it commandments came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day to get some. What did they find? No manna there. The Lord said to Moses, how long? And he, and he talks as though Moses was doing it, but it was the people. How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? So, friends, before God wrote his commandments on the stone, were there commandments? Was there a commandment even to keep the seventh day holy? Sure there was. It was taught to the people from the very beginning. Therefore, he gives you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day to look for manna. So the people rested on the seventh day. Well, perhaps Jesus changed his mind about the Sabbath. I'm just picking up some of these objections that are made. And Jesus says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. That's referring to the portion of the Old Testament that we call the prophets portion, the first five books that we call the law. You probably know that. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. In other words, I want you to have the fullness of what I want, what I have planned for you. For truly I say, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle. Now those are words that describe some, some Hebrew marks that are when that mark is over the letter, it's pronounced differently than without it and so forth, this kind of thing. You could think of it in, in English as punctuation marks, but it's actually more critical than that. Uh, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So love is the fulfilling of the law. You know what? You wouldn't even have to write the Ten Commandments. You think about them. First commandment says, thou shalt have no other gods besides me. Second commandment, no idols. 
third commandment, no swearing, and so on. All of this would work just with love, wouldn't it? In fact, the law wasn't written down. It was, it was communicated uh, from person to person, but uh, finally God wrote it down, which we know as the Ten Commandments. Did Jesus keep the Sabbath? Surely he did. He came to Nazareth where he was brought up, and his custom was he went to the synagogue what day? On the seventh day of the week, and he was asked to read. It's a fabulous story. Oh, man, I, I won't take the time. Well, it tells, I did put this in. They gave him the book of Isaiah. You understand there was no Bible. What, what, what did they have in their hands? A scroll. And they would hand you the scroll that was the book of Isaiah, or maybe two scrolls if it had to, if it was a lot of material. And so he picks that scroll up and starts to read. And uh, when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Uh, and I won't go on with the story, but it's a beautiful story. He, people were mesmerized by his reading, folks. He was so connected with his father that his words just moved them. And as he read the word, they were moved. And he said, this is fulfilled in your ears today. And they realized he was claiming to be the Messiah as he read that. And they tried to kill him. Amazing, these hot-headed people. None of you are ever hot-headed, are you? You're looking at the original hothead, actually. Sometimes it seems that way. <clears throat> Maybe the days are jumbled up, so we don't even know which day is the seventh. Let me show you some interesting examples. This man goes to Pilate, and he says, this Jesus has been crucified. Uh, and he, and he, asked, he asked Pilate to let him have Jesus, and he he approved it, so he took the, took the body down, wrapped it, and laid it in a, in a grave. And uh, that was the preparation day, and the Sabbath drew on. Does everybody in this country know what day Jesus died? Say yes. What do we call that day? Good Friday. Are you all with me on that? Good Friday. And uh, here, it's calling it the preparation day because we are supposed to prepare for the Sabbath on Friday. Get the dishes done, get the clothing ironed, get the shoes polished, whatever. Make sure there's gas in the car. <laughs> the preparation day. And the women, oh, and so the Sabbath drew on. Uh, most of you know, the Bible is clear on this. The Jewish people understand this. The Sabbath start, started last night at sundown. So as the Sabbath was drawing on, it meant sundown was approaching. And... Uh, they went to the sepulcher to see his body there. They returned to their homes and prepared some embalming fluid in the form of spices. They had no embalming fluid. So they would, they would get all these spices together and, and wrap up a corpse in cloth that was impregnated with these spices to try to just hold the, hold the degradation back a little bit of that dead body. Uh, but they didn't take it uh, to the grave. Why? Because the Sabbath had started, and that was considered work. Uh, so they waited until Sunday morning after the Sabbath uh, to take these spice-laden pieces of material. Early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And uh, I should have just stopped there. The point is this, folks. What, what do we call the day that Jesus was raised? Easter Sunday. And what did we call the Friday before? If you can find Good Friday and Easter Sunday, you can find the Sabbath in between. Got it? There was no mix-up in that question. Uh, so, uh, but wasn't the calendar changed? These are, it's interesting, friends. It, it amazes me sometimes, and I say this kindly, rational people will try to bring up some reason to say, I don't want to keep the Sabbath. Are you all with me on this? We should be searching. Lord, show me what you want me to do, right? But because these objections are raised, I asked your permission. If I could make a case for the fact that the seventh day is the Sabbath, God has in mind for us to be blessed with. Well, 
Yes, the calendar was changed. I think it was, well, it's on here, 1582. You may not know this. You know, you know this, that every four years we have a leap year, which means we put an extra day in the calendar. The reason for that is, is that the sun circles the earth in 365 and one quarter days. Is that correct? So every four years, we stick a day in there to make up that quarter day, correct? You all with me on this? Actually, it's not exactly one quarter. It's 11 minutes short. And so Julius uh, Caesar approved a calendar with a leap year in it, but along about the 16th century, 11 minutes a year had added up to about 10 or 12 days. And Easter was occurring too soon. So the Pope, who was the religious leader of the world, if you like, uh, engaged a number of scientists to study the question. And they decided uh, that they would take out of the calendar seven, eight, nine, ten days, is it? Uh, so that the 4th of October was followed by the 5th of October. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, by the 15th. You want to see that again? You okay with it? You're not talking to me. They took a number of days out of the calendar but Friday still followed Thursday. Are you with me? So the weekly cycle was unaffected. Y'all with me? Now it gets even trickier because it isn't exactly 11 minutes. So every time, th there are no leap years there, uh, in a year unless the year is divisible by 400. Did you know that? And uh, when that's the case, we add another day. And when it's divisible by 4,000, we add another day because it's not exactly, and we have to keep teasing this thing. And that is the Gregorian calendar. The scientists came to the Pope and suggested how to deal with this issue of the sun not exactly 365 days or 365 and a quarter. You all with me on the idea? You couldn't explain this to the next person, maybe, but you understand the idea. All right. So the calendar is not mixed up. In fact, I think it's the next picture. Oh, there it tells you about the 400 and so forth and the 4,000 and so forth. But here's a picture. Oh, I thought it was next. Maybe not next. And, and I'll bring that up in a minute. The Jewish observance of the Sabbath is interesting. Uh, all of you who have traveled know this. There's over 100 languages on the earth where the day, where the word for Saturday sounds like Sabbath. What did the Spanish say? Sabado. The Russians say Zubota, Supota. And on and on it goes. Sabado, okay, yeah. Um, so what does that tell you? This thing is entrenched in the world. Is that correct? That the seventh day of the week is the Sabbath. In fact, this is interesting. I've held uh, meetings in Lithuania. Their calendar has uh, Sunday as the seventh day of the week. Got it? So they're keeping the Sabbath. The trick is, though, that the, the name of the day before that sounds like Sabbath. <laughs> Got it? Even though they've made their calendar to try to look like Sunday is the seventh day. Because not, not the Lithuanian word, but all the Lithuanians know Russian because they were once part of the Soviet Union. You with me? And uh, it's the Russian word that uh, they use for the, what we call the seventh day of the week. So when you explain that, they, oh, they all, they all get it immediately because they know Russian. All right. Here's the uh, document. Four pages, I'm not going to read it to you, I'd like to. This was submitted to the U.S. Naval Observatory and also to the same organization in the U.K. And if you read these, and you're welcome to, I can email them to you if you'd like. Uh, 
they, they will tell you that the weekly cycle that is precisely understood even centuries before Bible times, before the New Testament times, to be unaffected. So the idea that, and you think about this, folks, it's, it's too bad that people want to throw up an objection and, and then, oh, well, okay, then they'll throw up another one. Are you all with me on this? And it all turns out to keep showing that God has in mind uh, for us to keep this same weekly cycle day. But we honor Christ's resurrection by keeping Sunday is another uh, objection. But actually the memorial for resurrection, uh, the, 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 the Sunday is, is uh, the day he, the memorial for Sunday is the day he was raised, but there's nothing in the Bible that says we're supposed to keep that day holy. Uh, and baptism is the memorial of that. That's the point that's being made here in this particular text. A warning by Jesus regarding the Sabbath and the future. This is very interesting, folks. This, he, Jesus is talking about seven, in, in AD 70, now that's going to be 40 years after he was here, that uh, Jerusalem would be destroyed. And this is what he says to them. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoever reads this, let him understand. The wording is a little challenging, but you can get the point. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So what Jesus knew ahead of time was that when uh, in AD 70, uh, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm sorry, when, uh, what's his name, Titus, came uh, to destroy the city, uh, they surrounded the city, and then, for reasons unknown except to God, they withdrew. And Jesus is referring to that brief period of time when they withdrew, and he said, get out of town when you see that. And in Daniel, Daniel uses this term, the abomination of desolation, which actually refers to an issue in the temple. But Jesus used that phrase to describe the departure of Titus, unexpected, for a short period of time. And what, does, what did Jesus say for them to do? Flee. Flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not even come down to take something. Just get out of there. Neither let him which is in the field go back to take his clothes. Just run. And woe unto them that are with child and those that give suck because it's so much more trouble to run with those children. But, but pray for this. This is Jesus speaking to the Jewish people 40 years before this thing is going to happen. And he says, pray like this, that it's not winter or what? Isn't that interesting? Jesus wanted them to understand that if they would ask God, he would help arrange so they could flee when it wasn't the Sabbath. Why? Because the Sabbath was, be, was to be kept holy. You're not supposed to load your trucks up and load your house and run with your... On Sabbath. Are you all with me on that? This is demonstrating, friends, that Jesus understood that the Sabbath was going to be kept according to his plan forever. But the majority couldn't be wrong. Jesus said, enter in the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many go there. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life, eternal life, if you will. And few there be that find it. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, but he that does the will of my Father. Now we've talked about this. Let me just remind you folks for clarity. We are saved by faith in God's grace. He requires obedience. It's all through the Bible. But just in case you weren't here, the reason, and you can lose your salvation, folks, by disobedience. Are you all with me? The reason it's not legalism is because true obedience is the result of God's power in you. It's not you, it's him. I'd love to expand on that, but I already did that, so I won't, take, I won't do that for you. But the Christian world in general will say, ah, oh, don't, works is bad. It's, it's a sad thing, folks. And, and my topic tonight, 
you can stand to come back for another hour of this. I'm going to discuss with you the principal cause of dementia. I think you ought to know what that is. Are you all with me? And I'll holler at you for a whole hour. I'll teach you more science than you wish you ever knew. But please come. My point here is this. I am supposed to care for this temple. Does God require that? Does he say the temple which you are is holy? And the Christian world believes that that's works. And the Christian world, folks, is paying the price for it, ignoring God's plan that I am to care for this body and that is a duty. You all with me on that? It's a duty. So it's a heartbreak. The way the enemy, folks, is playing with people's eternity, and, and they're inclined to make excuses. And I've tried to cover a bunch of them, and I hope you haven't noticed that it's after 12. Many will say in that day, Lord, have I, we not prophesied in your name and have cast out devils and have done many wonderful works? And why will, and then why will God say, uh, I never knew you? Here's the idea, folks. I can do, in my own strength, I can do good things. That's not God's plan. When I'm doing good things in my own strength, there, will there even be some benefit? Sure. But God says, that's not my plan. If that's the way you're living, I will have to tell you that I never knew you. And what he means by that, we didn't have an intimate relationship. I think it would be okay for me to say, I'll speak a little bit carefully. In the Bible, uh, when it says Adam knew his wife, you know what that means, right? So this idea of knowing is much deeper than just, hi, my name is James, right? So Jesus doesn't mean he didn't know, know who we were in that normal sense. I never knew you intimately. That's what he's saying because you were living without me. I'm making sense in what, what this scripture is describing here. Now, I'm going to quit, but I'll, let me tell you what the next 40 slides would, would say. Shall we take a vote? It's a long list of Protestants. First of all, it's a list of history showing that the cycle of the seventh day has never been lost. But then there's a long list, and I even took a bunch of them out, of Protestants recognizing that the seventh day of the week is Sabbath. A long list of Catholics, Catholics, right in their catechism it says, which day is the Sabbath? You know what the catechism says? Saturday is the Sabbath. If the, you may not know this, the Catholic catechism is a question and answer format. Next question, why do we then keep Sunday? Answer, by the authority of the Catholic Church, the, the day was changed from Saturday to Sunday. It says that right in the catechism. And that is the, and, and, the, and there are documents from Catholics who actually say, scholars, it's the mark of the church. I never presented a topic this week yet on the mark of the beast. It is, it is Sunday worship, folks, in the knowledge that God calls that sin. Are you all with me on that? That is the mark of the beast. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for your love. We realize how unworthy, but what a blessing, Lord. You love us more than we can imagine. You want us to be with you for eternity. The enemy hates that. He is doing anything he can, including just messing up this idea of worship on the seventh day to try to get people out of heaven, and lost for eternity. I just pray, Lord, that you'd bless every person here, that we determine to let you have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name.